Hi everyone, um, happy Saturday um, to anybody who's actually watching today. Otherwise, um, happy uh, weekend. Otherwise, happy whenever you're watching this. Um, there are a couple of things that we had uh, not gotten to talk about during class this past Wednesday. So I figured that I would take the opportunity to go over it in a Google Hangout just to review some stuff on retailing. Uh, since that's what chapter 17 is largely about. So I just wanted to reinforce some of the things that uh, are in that chapter. There are a couple of videos that I had in this slide and I encourage you to watch them because they show some interesting dimensions about retailing, um, particularly the future of retailing. There have been a few things that I had posted on Slack regarding retailing, um, regarding different ways of retailing, regarding bricks and mortar versus um, web-based stores. Uh, we've talked a little bit in class about how a lot of web-based businesses are paradoxically going into the brick and mortar uh, distribution channels as well. Uh, so there's a lot that we have that we can talk about uh, in perhaps Monday at the beginning of class. Anybody's watched this, um, perhaps my viewer teams will be using this if you're doing any Kickstarter projects. Uh, so let's go forward with the slide. So I'm going to switch my broadcasting, my screen share over to a PowerPoint. And there we go. So we're talking about retailing and retailing is a specific part of the distribution, uh, or the place for P fourth P, um, or third P, whichever order it is. Obviously there's no specific order of the P's. Um, so retailing is a specific uh, part of this distribution mix. Obviously, we've talked about distribution in terms of uh, channels and supply chain and how things go from the manufacturer all the way to the end user, the end consumer, the end customer. Retailing is a specific type of distribution strategy that actually looks more at the for, for many products, the last part of the distribution channel, the last part of place. Obviously, it's the part where people can go into a store and buy something. And there are a lot of different types of retailing strategy. There are a lot of different types of retail stores. So it's not um, as though you can just say, oh, well, there's a store. Why do some stores perform better than other stores? Why are some besides location? Why are some stores nicer than other stores? Why are some stores laid out differently than other stores? Why are some stores located differently than other stores? I mean, we talk about location and place. Obviously, that's a consideration, but it's not the only consideration that goes into a retail store, okay? So, Last time we talked about channels, we talked about distribution strategies, we talked about the value of intermediaries, right? Intermediaries allow uh, consumers to have uh, more options to buy things uh, from a centralized location. Um, clearly, they would provide value in terms of various functions, whether that's the form function, whether it's the time function, um, whether it's any uh, sort of logistical functions. There are multiple functions that intermediaries have that direct channel marketing does not necessarily work in the in best interest of the consumers. So you may want to think back to how if you have five televisions and you're selling to a mass market, it's easier to go through an intermediary than it is to sell direct to consumer. Again, this is one type of strategy. And we talked about a couple of different channel strategies that you might take, how channel strategies certainly can be directed towards specific demographics, towards specific locations, towards specific behaviors, and so forth. We also talked about the three different vertical administration, uh, the vert three different vertically administered channel strategies, right? We talked about corporate VMS, which was vertical, um, corporate VMS, which was when the company owned both the production and the distribution part. We talked about uh, contractual VMS where the company owned um, but had a significant influence on the downstream. For instance, the biggest uh, part of vertical management strategy was uh, franchise model, right? That's the one we're probably the most familiar with because the company owns 
a good chunk of the distribution manufacturing and so forth but then when they start getting into putting their product to the stores those stores are independently owned by franchisees and we also talked about administered vms which was essentially when one company has a substantial amount of power to push through the uh the marketplace okay so those are the three different types of vertical admin, uh, vertical marketing system strategies. So today we're going to talk about retail store types. We're going to go briefly over uh, some of the different types of retail stores. There are obviously, it's not just a store, but there are different types at different levels that distribute different things. There's a reason why Walmart is different from uh, Macy's. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the retail mix, right? So. The retail mix is part of place, which is then part of the marketing mix. So there is a mix for retail. And you'll notice when we go over it that it kind of mimics the marketing mix, but on a smaller, microcosmic, more specific level. Okay, And then we'll talk about the retail and the product life cycle briefly, um, because obviously products have certain life cycles and retailers are only going to carry them for certain amounts of time. So. What is retailing? Okay, again, we'll start off with a definition. So retailing is we're talking about the activities directly related to the sale of goods and services to the ultimate consumer for personal non-business use. Now, retailing as a percentage of U.S. employment is relatively significant. It's about 11%. Retailing as a percentage of U.S. business is about 12%. And retailing as a percentage of GDP, or uh, one of our main economic indicators of health in the economy, is about 66%. So all of this is activities related to the sale of goods and services to the ultimate consumer for personal non-business use. So. As you would imagine, retailing is a substantial part of our economy. It's why we have a lot of people who are employed in the retail industry who sell certain things. And we're looking at, again, not just the salespeople, but the people behind the scenes, all of the processes and activities that get the product to the consumer for end use. So it's important that we talk about the various aspects of retailing because we wanna know what it is and how it is that it gets, how it is that products get to the consumer, okay? So let's go back to my show for a second. Okay, so in terms of retail outlets, there are a variety of different types of retail outlets. For instance, there's outlets that are straight ownership model, such as an independent music store, a corporate chain of a music store, there are contractual ownership models such as franchises. So this obviously plays particularly into um, when we talked about contractual VMS, this plays a substantial role in that. Think about, again about, we've talked a couple times about Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks, how Dunkin' Donuts is franchise and Starbucks is company owned. Well, we tend to think of Store, we tend to think of these types of restaurants, fast food, coffee shop like that, as the coffee shop, the restaurant, and so forth. Reality is, is these are products and services that are being consumed by the end user. So we are talking about actual retail outlets. So we don't generally think about Dunkin' Donuts as a store, but yet Dunkin' Donuts in reality is a store. Taco Bell is, for better or for worse, is a restaurant. But we generally don't think about it, so we don't think about it as a store. But in reality, it is a store. Again, this is coming to the end user for consumption. So these are different types of model, uh, these different types of, of outlets that are within an ownership-based model. So if you say, well, these are ownership-based, well, what else do we have? We have cooperatives as well. These are contractual. So... For instance, a group of people come together to essentially own one particular market. Um, they may be member owned, they may be uh, owner owned, they may be, I can't remember, I'm off the top of my head what the third type of cooperative um, model is. But we also have service outlets as well. We also have merchandise lines. We can, we can classify by who owns 
the outlets. We can classify by what types of services the outlets provide. We can classify it by what type of merchandise the outlet provides. So we've talked about a little bit about ownership, different ownership models. Let's talk about service. Okay. When we talk about retailing, we can have a variety on a spectrum almost of services that are offered at the retail outlet. For instance, you can have a highly self-servicing model, a highly self-servicing outlet, retail outlet, or you can have a very full service outlet. Think about your gas stations, right? We don't really have that many full service gas stations here in Massachusetts, but if you think about full service where you don't have to get out of the car to pump your own gas, while self-service, you do have to pump your own gas. Well, that's very much like this, right? The level of attention that's given to you at the retail outlet is one way of classifying different retail outlets. So we can see that in a variety of self-service outlets, such as factory outlets or warehouse clubs, where the amount of service provided, the amount of attention, attention that's provided to the, uh, the consumer is relatively limited at best. Um, basically, everything is there on the shelves. There are few sales associates to ask anything for help. Nobody is really looking out for your best interests while you're in the store, but that's okay. It's basically a self-service retail outlet. That is in contrast with full-service outlets like exclusive stores like Nordstrom's where there are a lot of sales associates in the stores willing to help you out, willing to help you find things, willing to help you try things on, willing to ask information about something, willing to maybe even give style advice in an exclusive store. Um, think about a store, even more prestigious stores like a Burberry, um, where the level of attention that's given to you is much higher. And you come to expect that when you shop at that type, type of store. Again, think about a store that you, find, that you go into that you don't expect a high level of service. You don't expect, um, you expect more of a limited service to um, when you walk through the door and then all of a sudden somebody keeps coming up to you and somebody keeps coming up to you and somebody and they just don't leave you alone. Obviously there's a disconnect between the type of store that they envision themselves to be in the way that their customer service in the store is run. So in the middle, you might have something like a discount store, like a Walmart, um, where there are people available for help more of them than at, a uh, Costco, for instance, uh, it's a little bit nicer, there's more stuff, um, but you don't l expect the same level of attention and personal attention that you do in a store like Nordstrom. <coughs> okay, the third thing we talked about was merchandise lines. Okay, we've done some stuff with a product mix before, back in chapter uh, 11. And 12 um, that applies to the type of retail outlets that we have as well so we have stores that sell deeper product lines they have and obviously as you can see here they're talking about the number of items within each product line so if you sell shoes you just do one thing and you do it very deeply you have a lot of items just within shoes if you sell, there are a couple of hockey stores around here, for instance, that sell just hockey equipment and nothing else. These are deep product line stores. Specialty outlets are a type of or type of retail outlet that have deep product lines because specialty outlets tend to specialize in one type of product and they have all kinds of things of that product at a relatively low cost. That stands in contrast with a breadth of product line, okay? So this is a store that has a lot of different product lines. So look at a general merchandise store, like a department store, like a JCPenney, for instance. The breadth of JCPenney's product lines is relatively large. You're talking about shoes, you're talking about men's clothes, women's clothes, uh, maybe perfume, bedding, home essentials. Um, so you have obviously a lot of different things going on there. That's in contrast with the, uh, uh, a retail store like maybe Foot Locker, where maybe they've got a limited amount of clothing, 
but mostly shoes. That stands in contrast with a store like maybe Sports Authority, which has a lot of different product lines, whether it's hockey equipment, baseball equipment, basketball equipment, but they may have a lot of different items within each product line. So unlike Pure Hockey, which only sells hockey equipment at rather, you know, at, at a rather deep product line, Sports Authority may sell quite a few items of hockey equipment, but because they're so broad, they're a different type of store. So you can obviously see the different ways that merchandise lines can affect the type of store you have. Consumers will go to one store for one thing. Consumers will go to another store for another thing. Again, it depends on the needs of the consumer. So different retail outlets position by product line according to the way they anticipate consumer needs to line up. There are also, we, th we think about retailing in terms of purely stores, but retailing is not just purely stores. There are a lot of ways for the end user to get something, to get a product that are that is not merely in an actual physical store. So obviously we've talked about bricks and mortar as being one way uh, of, of going into the retail store. And we've talked about online retailing, which you can see on this chart, which is also an, an alternate. But there are also other ways of, of retailing. And you can see that this chart breaks it down by how involved the retailer is versus how involved the consumer is. The lowest end of this is automatic vending machine. You don't think about vending machines as being retail, do you? But based on what we talked about for our definition of retail and what retailing is, a vending machine is actually retail. It's the point at which you're getting, the consumer is getting a product or service. Okay, But there is virtually no retailer involvement and there's virtually no consumer involvement. So we tend to ignore vending machines as retail outlets. And yet, if you take the T or you look in airports, you frequently now are seeing automatic vending machines that sell things other than uh, basic soft drinks. You see vending machines that are best buy vending machines that have really low retailer involvement and really low consumer involvement, but still offer products to, say, a traveler on the go. Somebody wants to buy an iPhone on the go, they can buy it at a Best Buy vending machine. Somebody needs to buy um, a Surface tablet on the go, they can buy it at a vending machine. All kinds of things that are being sold in these Best Buy vending machines. But my point is, again, active retailer involvement is really low, but so is active consumer involvement. As we move up across this chart, you see we moved to direct mail and catalogs. Obviously, those are things that are relatively uh, going to buy and buy these days because of the internet. Um, but they do still take a substantial amount of, uh, of, of money that, uh, and obviously not just to, to put out, but for consumers to, put, to actually purchase from. Um, there's still a consistent way to sell things. Television home shopping, right? QVC, obviously that's one of the probably HSN, QVC, those are probably the two top television home shopping um, where companies maybe will put their products in, relatively high involvement, maybe some in the middle, same with active consumer involvement, they call in, they order their thing. Online retailing, telemarketing, and direct selling up at the top, right? Direct selling usually is requires personal selling. It's the type of um, retailing that if you think about something like, like Avon, um, where you have a representative who sells Avon products directly to you, the consumer, there's generally no retail store. In fact, companies like Avon and uh, Mary Kay have long shied away from doing retail in the store, um, but it means that there's a high active involvement on the part of their sales force, but also a high consumer involvement. So let's throw in a couple of these examples, again, in some picture forms. Automatic vending machines, again, you see the Best Buy one with Coca-Cola, direct mail, home shopping, online retailing, telemarketing, and again, I mentioned the Avon example is direct selling, okay?
Just making sure that my microphone is back on. Okay. Now we have retailing strategy. Okay, retail strategy leads to retail store positioning. So you think about what we talked about in terms of the marketing organization from an organizational level, right? And you realize that we've talked about how there are various functions within the broad marketing department. You think about how there's a chief marketing officer who maybe controls the marketing department, or not controls, but who runs the marketing department. And within that, there are all of the different people doing all of the different functions we've talked about so far. We've got researchers. We've got people who are working on brand management. You have people who are working on looking at brand positioning and targeting. You have people who are looking at just on pricing models. Well, we have the same move in, in terms of retail strategy as well. People who are looking at retail store positioning because retailing is not just distribution it's also partially a service we talked about services making up a substantial portion of the economy retailing is a service and so there's going to be some positioning within that because you want to be able to uh, differentiate yourself from other retail stores again I mentioned being able to classify yourself uh, in terms of your ownership model, I mentioned being able to classify yourself in terms of uh, merchandising lines and so forth. All of these things are ways to position your store. Well, through that, we have the retail mix, okay? Because retailing is a service and because retailing is also offering products, we have two things we need to worry about. The first is merchandise management. You need to be able to understand what merchandise you have online. Uh, online, you have uh, what merchandise you have an in inventory, um, what merchandise you want to have an in inventory, how much merchandise you want to have an in inventory, and so forth. Okay, so looking at the merchandise itself that you're providing is one aspect of the retailing mix. The other aspect of the retailing mix is the store management. So looking at we talked, for instance, about when we talked all the way back in consumer behavior, we talked about atmospherics as being important to the uh, to getting consumers to buy certain things. Well, obviously, this includes things like your employees. This includes things like your layout. This includes things like your promotions and store. This includes the variety of different things that go into managing the actual store itself. So these two things, the, the merchandise and the actual store management, are two of the critical aspects of the marketing mix. Okay, So those two things are again we talk about levers right and the strategies and the levers of strategy that we have we have four different strategy four different levers that we can work with the first is retail pricing guess what actually if you think about it this way if you're looking at this chart the four uh, levers that we have here are very similar to the ones that we have in the marketing mix we have a pricing we have a P, a place location. We have communication or promotion. And we have merchandise, which is product. So we have almost, it's a, none of these are showing a four P's, but we have almost a four P's of retailing, okay? Retail pricing, so this is how much we should set costs at within the store. Again, we've talked about pricing and manufacturer suggested prices. Well, now the retailer can set the prices as well. That's one of the benefits of our retailer as intermediary. We talk about store location. Obviously, understanding what the best locations are real estate wise for uh, your store relative to market, to shifting market, the market demand, the demographics of the market, and so forth. Um, again, as a, as a major uh, company that looks at store location, is Starbucks. They have a special portfolio essentially of real estate people who look at real estate for Starbucks to determine where best to introduce a Starbucks in the community and they spend a lot of time trying to invest uh, in their real estate portfolio as to where stores should be opened up so there's one aspect of location we have retail communication right you have to promote the store you have to be able to promote um, you have to be able to promote uh, things that are going on in the store. You have to be able to promote um, any sort of uh, 
promotions or coupons or sales or anything else, discounts that you have that you want customers to know about. Uh, all of these things are important to the store because obviously getting people to go into the store is important. And then finally, we have merchandise. Obviously, the product, um, uh, the, the retailer is generally not responsible for creating the product. But they do need to know what the product is, what products will sell, what products sell in that store, what the demographic market is, how much inventory should they have in the store, and so forth. So merchandise strategy is also important. So these four things, the pricing, the location or the place or location, the promotion or communication, and the product or merchandise are all part of these this retailing mix. And I encourage you to look at this tech savvy um article in retailing today about um, the consumer's new app uh, for Macy's because I think it's kind of interesting the way Macy's has uh, changed its strategies and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. We actually talked about it a little bit earlier on in the semester when we talked about uh, Macy's um, and then when they were closing some of their stores up. <laughs> All right, let's talk about retailing positioning. So there are two dimensions on which we can look at retail positioning. One of them has to do with the product line itself, which we've talked about. And the other one has to do with the value added or the service level added, as we talked about. So you can position on service level and you can position on product lines. So if you look here, we've got four you know, quadrants of value added or service value added versus breadth of product line. Walmart, highly broad, low service level. Bloomingdale's, highly broad, high service level. Right, totally different. But what's the difference between Bloomingdale's and Macy's? Well, Bloomingdale's has broad service, uh, broad uh, product line. Tiffany's specializes in what? Specializes in jewelry. So you have a high level of service, but a relatively narrow product line. All right, so Tiffany specializes in uh, jewelry um, with high level of service. How about pay less shoes? Well, they specialize in shoes, but the service level is relatively low. Okay, so we see how these different types of uh, positioning on these on these two different types of attributes can lead towards a strong retail brand position. Okay, so there we have the positioning. How about pricing? Well, we've talked in terms of pricing about every day low pricing versus high low pricing. We can use that as a retail strat. We can use the pricing model as a retail strategy. That's one thing we can do. So, right, so Walmart, every day low price. How about benchmark or signpost items? So these are items that retailers sell that create reference points within the store. Again. <coughs> If you see a can of Coke for 99 cents, you know that it's going to be relatively cheap. The store is probably relatively cheap. But if you see a can of Coke for a buck fifty, you already start to feel because you know what a can of Coke should normally cost, that it's probably an expensive store, especially if you see a $2 can of Coke. So we use that as a benchmark item for consumers to set as the reference point to the rest of the uh, the products. I look at it in terms of retail in terms of retail again like a restaurant. Typically when I go to a restaurant, you think of an average burger as what, eight dollars, nine dollars? You know, a decent quality burger. If I see a burger that is fifteen dollars, <throat> I expect that the burger is gonna be either super really good and or that it's gonna be everything else on the menu is gonna be re really expensive. Or even pasta. If pasta was ten dollars, you know, maybe it would be borderline. So you see these items that people have for benchmark that signal the way the rest of the pricing uh, would be going. Off price items. So look at TJ Maxx and Marshalls who sell um, for as they brand themselves, Shopportunity, Shopportunistic. They sell name brands at low cost. These are off price. Their whole pricing model is based on selling well-known brands at low price. Now, part of this has to do with the merchandise they get. They get off-season uh, stuff. 
uh, from name brands. They get uh, trends that have, have died out and so forth, but they can sell it at a lower price. Warehouse clubs do this as well. Outlet stores do this as well. Look at the difference between Nordstrom and Nordstrom Rack. Substantial difference in the way that pricing is, even though the kind of uh, products and the kind of merchandise they sell is the same. Even though Nordstrom Rack is going to sell you what they sold at Nordstrom six months from six months ago, the prices are going to be substantially lower. Single or extreme value stores. Think about Dollar Tree or Family Dollar, right? <clears throat> None of those things are can possibly cost a dollar to manufacture. Okay, maybe some of the things, but <clears throat> okay. So we've talked about promote. Uh, we've talked about positioning. We've talked about pricing. How about retail location? Where do you put stores? So we asked ourselves a bunch of different questions about where to put the stores, right? Part of it looks at the demographic trends within the area, right? It doesn't make sense to put certain stores if you're competing on pricing, if you're competing on um, service levels. It doesn't make sense to put them in uh, demographics that maybe won't shop there. So you want to know where to locate the store. Sometimes it goes. It requires going into a central business district, so looking downtown, right? So maybe a store wants to go into downtown Lowell because that's in this, you know, revamped central business district. A regional shop, shopping center, okay? <clears throat> Attracting customers within a five to ten mile range, maybe a slightly bigger than a strip mall. Um, I'm trying to think of when it might be local. I think um, uh, I was going to say maybe one of them might be the Pheasant Lane Mall up in Tingsboro. Uh, where we're trying to get people within a five to ten mile range to come to shop at the stores. So maybe you'll want to go into a mall like that. They have anchor stores in those malls. Those are the main stores at the corners of the mall. Usually those are the ones you can enter into. Think about anchor about examples of anchor stores like a JC Penney's or Sears or uh, Target or um, where else might be an anchor store uh, Nordstrom um, Dick's uh, Sports Authority um, those tend to be the anchor stores that you would see those are the big stores community shopping center which tracks customers from within a 10 to 20 minute drive <coughs> So maybe um, uh, a little bit, you know, a little bit smaller, depending on where you live. Looking at multiple channels, so store versus non-store. Obviously, in terms of retailing, the two big store, non-store, multiple channels are what traditional stores and online retailing. So obviously it's a retail location that has no location. So um, certainly it's possible. Again, multiple channel store, non-store. We talked about vending machines. Best Buy stores, Best Buy vending machines. Um, so it's possible to look at location in terms of different distribution channels, different retail locations using different types of channels. How many stores do you have? Right. You want to be able to meet market demand. You want to be able to be, meet market. Uh, you want to be able to supply the market, but you don't want to overextend yourself and then find you have to close up shop, close up some shops. Um, we talked very early in the semester about Macy's closing about 140 different stores across the country. Obviously, the shift online has kind of rendered uh, some of the actual retail outlets to be in existence, but which ones do you keep? Which ones do you not keep? How do you estimate, how do you judge which store to keep or not keep? It's obviously important considerations in terms of retail location. Other factors, I'm not gonna go over all of them in depth, but socioeconomics, traffic flow, zoning regulations. Thinking about zoning regulations is interesting. Um, I was thinking about uh, the uh, uh, Pheasant Lane Mall is actually, I believe in Nashua. Um, most of the mall is in Nashua, except for part of it, which is in Tingsboro. Well, obviously, there's zoning regulations that may have gone on with that. 
um, in terms of Nashua uh, wanting to attract uh, more people. Maybe Tingsboro wanted to have more tax revenues since uh, Nashua would be tax free. A lot of the different things would go into locations. Obviously, businesses would want not to have to pay the taxes um, if they didn't have to uh, to be in Nashua. So again, different different considerations in terms of what uh, location you might be selecting. Price, location, promotion. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to talk next week about integrated marketing communications. More of that we're talking about in terms of the customer. We're talking about that in terms of um, what types of communications we get out specifically to the customer from the manufacturer, from the brand, from the uh, company that's making the product or service. But retailers also use communications as well. Um, retailers position a store communicating a specific image. One way of doing this is through shopper marketing. So how do you get uh, promotions to shoppers? Displays, retail displays within a store, something we call the end caps. These are the displays that are at the end of an aisle. You know, as you're walking from one aisle in a store uh, into the, you know, around the corner into the next aisle, usually you see some display at the end of the aisle, at that end where you walk around. It's called an end cap. An end cap display is obviously one way of communicating. Samples, right? Who doesn't like to go to the grocery store and find out that it's a grocery a sample day and then you find out that you've gone through the entire store and now you've been able to essentially have lunch in the store with samples. Companies like um, Costco or BJ's or Sam's Club all use samples heavily because there's not much else that they can do to communicate to the customer that certain products are in the store. So they use samples as a way to communicate that, hey, this product is in the store. And by the way, here, try it. Okay. In-store coupons. Obviously, um, with text messages, for instance, you can now go in, in, in apps, you can now go into the store and find coupons as you're in the store. Um, we've talked a little bit about mobile payment, and I certainly had put uh, an article up on Slack from the Financial Times about e-payments. If you use Apple Pay or Andrew, Android Pay, now when you're in a store, if you have a loyalty card, then they know to send you a coupon when you're in that store based on uh, geo-targeting. So now in-store coupons play a substantial role of the type of communications and type of promotions that the retailer is able to use. So the internet and digital is, is being used, leveraged in conjunction with traditional retail models, traditional store models in very novel ways. We generally don't think about salespeople when we think about the stores, but if you go into an Apple store, you see these guys, right? <clears throat> they all wear the same uniform. Obviously, they are trying to be consistent among employees. That is another way to communicate a certain image. Again, there's an end cap that we talked about at Target for Sonos. Image. So communicating the different price ranges, communicating the depth of merchandise lines. Some of that is in store, but some of that is also through, think about, um, we'll come back to Best Buy since we've been using them fairly frequently in this, in this uh, particular lecture. Best Buy sends out flyers on the weekend or with the Sunday paper uh, or in the store. All of those things communicate the breadth of the merchandise lines. So, um, there are ways to communicate that there are a bunch of different merchandise lines. Another thing is the store layouts. We generally pay limited attention to the way a store is laid out, but you ever notice that a grocery store, you know, every couple of years is changing the way it's laid out? Well, what they're essentially doing is looking at traffic patterns and demand of certain products and trying to figure out what's the best way to put these uh, aisles in an order that a shopper would easily find what he or she is looking for. Or, really the opposite way, 
and looking at it and saying we're rather than laying it out to be easy we make it very difficult so i always find since i've moved to this side of the state when i've been uh, uh shopping at market basket if anybody's gone shopping at market basket it's always almost impossible to find uh certain products until you start to understand how the store is laid out which i haven't really yet but when if you're not so if you're not really understanding how the store is laid out it makes it very difficult so you spend a lot of time in the store trying to find the things that you are looking for and sometimes one item such as bread might be completely nowhere near jelly or chips and soda might not really be near each other within the store and you have to go through the entire store to figure out where it is so again that communicates maybe a certain type of image about the store. Creating an atmosphere that continues to communicate the store position. So atmospherics then plays a substantial role in what type of positioning and image the consumer sees. Right? We've talked about this in terms of consumer behavior. We've talked about consumer perception. Well, this is a continuation of this. This is looking at the ambience of the store. This is looking at the emotion and experience that consumers would have in the store to basically be consistent with that image. So different ways that we can control atmospheric. Here are different types. Employee type and density. Okay, Talk about the Apple uh, Apple stores, the different employee type is a specific employee type. They always have their uniforms on. They wander around just looking to see if you have, need help. There are a bunch of them. Again, some of this relates to the service level. Merchandise type and density we've talked about. Fixture type and density. So we haven't really talked about this, but lighting makes a difference. Right? The way things are laid out in the store, the way the lights are, the way there's uh, research that looked at um, whether you use halogen lights versus uh, incandescent lights versus uh, fluorescent lights and how that affects consumer purchasing. Um, obviously, well-lit stores is beneficial. Some stores are a little bit not as well-lit. Um, when you look at where things are located uh, in the store, um, obviously, that plays a role. Sound plays a role. A lot of research that looks at using slower, more uh, subdued songs to keep people feeling relaxed. And as they feel relaxed, they spend more time in the store looking. It leads them to uh, be more elaborative, be more cognitive while they're making uh, their choices. Odors, right? Certain odors are positive. They help make us feel good. They give us a better experience. They maybe make our mouth water. Again, we've talked about uh, the bread and the flowers in a supermarket, making you really want to buy more food as the smell makes you start to salivate and so, sort of unconscious um, visual factors. Again, lighting, brightness, so forth. Okay. Question that I have, all right, on the left we have um, the Apple Store. And this is after an opening, right, of an Apple Store. You see all these people. What does this atmosphere project onto the customer about Apple? What does this say? There are a lot of different ways to interpret that. How about on the right? This is actually now closed down, I think, as of the summer. But the Toys R Us that was in Times Square. You see here a giant Ferris wheel. What does that project to the consumer? What is the consumer supposed to infer about Toys R Us from this Ferris wheel? Okay. The way that a store communicates what it does, who it is, what its identity is, what its prices are, what the consumer is supposed to find out, all can be conveyed using the store atmospherics. So atmospherics are definitely important. And that goes to small business stores as well. I think a lot of small business stores just think about the type of merchandise they're selling, but they kind of neglect that, to realize that there is a certain atmospheric that they project to the consumer. 
and they have the ability to use the levers of retail mix to project certain things. Okay. All right, we've talked about merchandise, category management. So looking at maximizing sales profits in a particular category, trade deals, order cost, brand assortment, order quantities, prices, all of these things have tied in with the depth and breadth of a merchandise line. Looking at marketing metrics. So, and you're not going to need to know these for the exam um, or on the next one, but um, you know, there are ways of calculating same store growth. There are ways of calculating sales per square foot. Sales per square foot is a relatively uh, common metric that's used in retailing. How many sales does a square foot of retail space um, yield? And the reason that's a common retail, anybody maybe have an idea about why sales per square foot might be so common? Um, largely because you want to be able to find out since retail space is at a premium in certain locations. You want to be able to maximize your sales volume for a certain amount of space. So it seems like it's very, it's very narrow, but what it's really saying is, is if you have a big store and you do not have a lot of sales, you could essentially have an inefficient store. If you have a small store with a lot of sales, it means you maybe have a highly efficient sales per square foot. You may have a lot of efficiency in your selling. Okay. So a high sales per square foot is good or bad depending on what you're talking about, um, the, the, depending on the conversation. I mean, if you're the business, you want to have a good high sales per square foot. But if you're trying to um, get into a retail space and you're a relatively new business and your sales per square foot are relatively low, it's going to be difficult to get in there versus other companies that have high sales per square foot. Other metrics, and you're not going to need to know all of these for the exam specifically. We have three different types, customer-based metrics, product-based metrics, and financial-based metrics. So customer-based metrics could range from the number of transactions per customer, how many customers per day, month, week, time, how long have they been in the store. Okay, Again, you are not going to need to know all of these for the exam, but just to give you some indication of what retailers are looking at. Looking at products. We mentioned an intermediary can give downstream information up, right? We can give upstream information from the retailer. Well, what might or the manufacturer? Well, from the retailer to the manufacturer. What might a retailer need to give up? Well, how much product of its products are returned? How much does it cost them to carry the inventory? How many number of items does the customer have per transaction? Okay. All of those things might be important to upstream uh, manufacturers. But lastly, we talk about some of the um, uh, metrics such as return on sales, markdown percentage, you know, if you're running a promotion, sales per employee, margins, and so forth. Okay. I have here a video, again, putting how Target puts together this marketing mix. I encourage you um, to look, to watch it. This looks specifically about how retailers get you to buy. And I think it's interesting, some of the in-store psychology that consumer that retailers use vis-a-vis -vis putting the marketing mix together. So again, I encourage you to watch this video. It's a relatively short video. Now I mentioned we look at retail in terms of the product mix and the product life cycle. Well, in the early stages of a product life cycle, you're going to want to get into um, relatively exclusive uh, distribution in terms of retail. <clears throat> because again, you see here the market share increases and then in its maturity it starts to decrease over into decline. Same thing happens in the profitability. It actually reaches m most of its profitable potential about towards the end of its uh, growth phase and then as it starts to hit into maturity uh, it declines right well the same thing happens here 
So who, if you're in the introduction phase or early, early growth, where would you want to be at? Well, value retail, online retail, single brand, all places that have maybe exclusive distribution, which have distribution that um, consumers you know, have an easy time finding, but only in specific places. Then as you start to accelerate, you maybe you go into uh, single price factory outlet stores, warehouse clubs. In the very decline, you start to see things relegated towards business district retailers or more like strip malls. You start to see general stores, catalog retailers, right? Those things make sense because what happens at the end of the product life cycle? You're probably in a mass market distribution, but you're really wanting to see if you can get rid of your stuff, whether you need to harvest it or delete it, right? Maturity is mass market, right? Your late majority. And so having it in a department store or convenience store is probably your best bet because you'd be able to attract the most amount of people. You're already hitting the innovators, the early adopters, the early majority, and the late majority who are now in the maturity phase. So what's the future of retailing? Okay, we've talked significantly about um, We've talked significantly about uh, retailing vis-a-vis -vis, um, the internet. As I mentioned before, we've talked about it in terms of um, uh, bricks and mortar versus actual retail outlets. And I've put in a number of um, articles from the Financial Times that was actually uh, from this past week. One was on e-payments. Uh, one was on customer service and online sales. Okay, so we're talking about how um, customer service in other uh, aspects of a business might lead to customer sales. We've talked about the third phase of digital revolution, of digital evolution, how uh, consumers want to connect with what they're buying and how technology sometimes struggles to cross that, that chasm of, uh, of uh, connection. So is there a way that we can be able to make uh, consumers understand in the digital marketplace, in the digital e-tail space? We talk about multi-channel services, okay? So that kind of ties into this, <coughs> what I'm getting into here. We have customer experience management where we're trying to create different experiences for target mar markets. So there's an article I mentioned about anthropology and consumer behavior. There's an article that looks at the American Girl doll stores. If any of you have ever seen or had an American Girl doll and you know what I'm talking about, the stores now, the retail stores that they have, are really an experiential place for you to experience the, the brand. I'm really trying to have this kind of experience where in this article they talk about a lot of grandparents who go with their grandchildren to the American Girl doll store who then have this experience of picking out the doll, of clothing the doll. As you see here, it looks like they're doing haircuts and makeup on the dolls and so forth. They really try and create not just a basic store, but an experience, a lo the Lego store. Any of those stores almost in Times Square in New York have these experiences that are not traditional retail. And retailers, as a result, are trying to bring experience into the store, right? Instead of just shopping, you're going for an experience. And that creates more demand for bricks and mortar stores rather than just buying stuff online. Multi-channel and omni-channel, okay? So this is when users engage in multiple communications channels simultaneously. Talking about catalogs, talking about television, talking about online and in-store. Using these all at once, right? How many people have gone into a store, pulled out their phone, and gone shopping online while they're in a store? Well, that's a problem for retailers, who have not quite figured out how to harness that. So again, here is an article in on Slack on online and real shops merge into a seamless customer experience. Efficient multi-channel services is the way of the future. And 
they obviously provide a variety of different examples, one of which is this Bass Pro Shops that have actual experiences within the store that lead you to use your phone, but also to shop in, in store as well. And then lastly, there was an article on uh, online shopping facing growth hurdles. So there are several of these online uh, retail applications. So what is omni-channel versus multi-channel? Well, here's a graphic that shows a single channel, okay? You have one touch point, the retailers have a touch point. That's what we're typically used to. Okay. As the internet's come along, we now have multi-channel marketing. So you're seeing different touch points independently. And what we mean by touch points is the different places that you have uh, access to, um, to the store, okay? So your different interaction points that you see with the store. So you used to have a touch point in the store, you used to have a touch point online, you used to have a touch point in the catalog, and each of these was independent of each other. But you had multiple touch points. You had multiple inter place, potential places to see, to interact with the store. Well, that leapt then to cross-channel, okay? What ended up happening was, was all of these different touch points, all of these different act interaction points became part of the same brand. What it meant was that you could go to a store and what you'd see online and what you'd see, what you'd see on the catalog and what you'd see in the store were pretty much all aligned, but part of the same brand in different touch points. The future, and I know that there's been this idea of leveraging multi-channel, and they've kind of synonymized multi-channel with omni-channel. They've kind of re just redefined it. But this idea of omni-channel marketing, this omni-channel retailing, consumers are now seeing the brand in multiple channels within the same context, okay? So when you go into Macy's, you're expected to be able to – to find the products you're expected to be able to see the same promotions as you would on your phone within the store as you would online and you know and on your computer as you would in a catalog all of these things are consistent throughout so what has macy's done well they've used a lot of qr codes in the store for instance where if you're in a specific section of the store and you can't find a sales associate you can then look at the qr code on your phone to try and order um, a specific size if they're out of stock. Um, the same with any other uh, uh, part of the store. Um, to be able to get coupons within the store, again, geo-targeting, where now that they know they're in the store, they'll come up with a promotion on your phone that works and is leveraged to the actual store location specifically. And maybe it is specific to that location. So rather than have each communication touch point be independent of each other, they're realizing that they can coordinate all of them together. So that is omni-channel marketing. So how has Macy's been so successful? Well, I have here another um, little short clip on Macy's going omni-channel marketing and the different things that they're doing to get success in the omni-channel space. Okay. And yes, they did have to close a lot of their, uh, you know, 140 stores. Part of that is because of the way the market conditions have been, the, econo the economy. Okay. Obviously, that plays into locations and where you can sustain business and where you cannot sustain business. But on the whole, it's generally been accepted within the past couple of years that as a department store with a broad product line and uh, a variety of different SKUs, that they have done a really good job of making sure that even if people do not see, <clears throat> you know, even if people come in the store, rather than going to buy it online somewhere else, they can buy it from Macy's.com. And they've integrated everything into omni-channel, right? All omni, like omnipresent, like omniscient, omni-channel, all around. Okay. So basically to wrap it up, we've talked a lot about the value of intermediaries, you know, the channel strategies, the administered strategies. We've talked about retailing and the product life cycle. And we've kind of talked again about the future of, of retailing. Now, I'm curious as to what you guys think. 
Um, especially given the fact that I've posted several of these articles on Slack dealing with e-payments, dealing with multi-channel marketing, dealing with consumer experience, dealing with online hurdles, you know, that consumers are finding, you know, that, 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 that retailers are finding about consumers that, you know, even though we see massive growth in e-tailing, we still are stymied by people wanting to try things on. I had posted an article about the digital mirror that lets you try on an entire store without having to leave the digital mirror, right? Again, technology has been used in different ways to change retailing service scape. How exactly, you know, do you think that companies should leverage digital tools? What about small businesses? How do you think that small businesses can leverage tools online versus in store? versus traditional marketing, right? Can small businesses can ever compete again unless they have enough money to buy and manufacture, uh, to buy, not to buy and manufacture, but to program digital uh, tools, right? How can you have a digital mirror in your store if you're a small business, if a digital mirror is gonna cost you $40,000, right? What can the small business do? So I'd like you to think about that Post some answers to Slack, you know, or, or not answers, but some responses to Slack and have a discussion about what you think the future of retailing is. You guys are, you know, going to be running some of these, you know, uh, retailing departments. What do you think that retailers should be doing to attract not just the current generation, but in the next five years of, uh, of how retailers can capture more market share, more profitability, and so forth, okay? The next time we talk, we're going to talk about the last P, okay? Um, I have up here place. What I really meant was promotions. We're going to talk about integrated marketing communications, and when we're going to talk some, because um, we've got about a lecture and a half or so, I may have to do another Google Hangout um, to fill in some of the gaps. Uh, but we're talking about everything from advertising, which is persuasion. We're talking about personal selling, which is one-on-one -on -one sales force. We're talking about direct uh, marketing, where we use catalogs and mailing and flyers and other ways that we, the manufacturer, directly market to the consumer, uh, 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 promote to the consumer. We're talking about sales promotions, like coupons and discounts. All of these things fall under the promotional mix. So we will talk about that next time. And um, uh -huh. we'll talk about that next time. And um, hopefully that uh, everybody has a good weekend. And I will see everybody on Monday when we talk about integrated marketing communications. I think it's probably one of the more fun topics. Um, I mean, there's a couple of fun topics in, <laughs> in the whole of marketing. Um, but integrated marketing communications, especially because we understand advertising or we, we see advertising so much, is probably one of the more fun things we, we talk about because we're looking at how to work everything together within the promotional mix, right? We had a retailing mix. We kind of had a pricing mix. We have um, uh, a product mix. And now we'll have a promotional mix as well. So otherwise, I will see everybody on Monday and have a good weekend. Bye-bye.